Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So this is part eight of Intimations of a New Worldview, and this is called The Will to Power. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Thank God. So um, this is an outline of what part eight is going to be about. So in the first video, this video of part eight, we are going to talk about the psychology and the cognitive science underlying the will to power. I'm going to make some uh, some claims that I expect will be controversial, uh, which is fine. These are things that I haven't written about yet in detail, but I will be writing about them soon on my Substack. Uh, so this is, um, I think this first video especially is a little bit messy. Uh, it's a little bit messy in my presentation of it, but this is the best I could do on short notice to uh, communicate these ideas. Um, I'm going to do the best I can with it, and then I will be writing about it at some point in time on my Substack. I'll be writing about these things and can put it in a more, hopefully, a little bit more organized um, uh, perspective. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be more organized about it on my Substack. But uh, the second video is going to be about the metaphysics of the will to power. I think that one's a little bit more organized. And then in the third video, we're going to look at we're going to look at how Nietzsche has a particular kind of morality. Uh, I'm going to argue it's the same as the morality that Jordan Peterson had in Maps of Meaning, essentially, although Nietzsche didn't call it morality. But it's it's a process understanding of morality, which is so different, really, from the way that we normally understand morality that Nietzsche would not want to call it morality. But it's a kind of morality because he is making value judgments and he's making objective value judgments based on his ontology of the will to power, his metaphysics of the will to power. We're going to look at how this manifests in the figure of the overman for Nietzsche and in the figure of the revolutionary hero for Jordan Peterson and Maps of Meaning. We're going to see that there's a lot of overlap between how Nietzsche talked about the overman uh, and how Jordan Peterson talked about the revolutionary hero. So uh, let's get into it. So I was originally uh, of the opinion, which is an opinion that I inherited from Jordan Peterson, that Nietzsche had done a good job of formulating the problem of nihilism. Uh, he had announced the problem um, of nihilism. Uh, many people still don't really understand that problem, but but Nietzsche has, ha of course, had a huge effect on Western culture, and and he did do a good job of of tracing uh, the genealogy of nihilism. And you know, my opinion was that Nietzsche's solution to the problem, which was tied up with his ideas about the will to power and the overman wasn't really a viable solution. Um, so Nietzsche called this the revaluation of all values, and it consists of concepts like the will to power and the overman, and the, these have been subject to a really a huge number of interpretations, and also, in my opinion, some very clear misinterpretations. And it's all very confusing. Um, that is until I read this 1996 book by John Richardson called Nietzsche's System. And that book convinced me uh, as soon as I, you know, when I read that book, I was like, OK, uh, it, it became obvious because uh, Nietzsche did put forward a viable solution to the problem. And it, and it turns out that the solution that, that Nietzsche put forward is essentially the same as the solution that I've been putting forward in this series of videos. Uh, Nietzsche uses a different vocabulary and a different uh, different set of evidence. Of course, he had very different kinds of evidence available to him than I had to me. But the general thrust of his argument, uh, the general thrust of his solution to the problem of nihilism is the same as the one that I've been putting forward in this series of videos. Um, Nietzsche has often been described as a relativist. And this is wrong. I mean, this is, this is dead wrong. If you read Nietzsche, there's nothing relativistic about, about him, uh, in my humble opinion. Um, my contention, along with some modern interpreters like John Richardson and Serena Doyle and Paul Curtis, and we'll talk about all of their work uh, here. Uh, my contention is that Nietzsche's will to power thesis was the basis for making principled and even objective value judgments without the need for a two worlds mythology. So we talked in part four, a little bit in part five, about uh, how during the Axial Age, there was, uh, there arose around the world, different worldviews that conceptualized the world in, in, in terms of uh, a sensory world, and then a transcendent realm. Uh, and the transcendent realm was generally of more value than the mere sensory realm, right? Well, that's the two worlds mythology. And Nietzsche was trying to make value judgments objective again without the two worlds mythology and the will to power is a uh is a uh, a way of doing that 
So it's a, it's a basis for making objective value judgments within the continuous cosmos, um, within the conceptualization of the world where everything is continuous. And so my goal in this, uh, in this part of the series is to describe this argument as best I can and to update it by integrating it with modern scientific advancements, uh, with modern scientific theory and evidence. Um, I think that modern scientific findings have largely vindicated Nietzsche. Uh, properly understood, Nietzsche got it right. Uh, he got it right intuitively more than anything, but modern scientific uh, research has vindicated his intuitive and uh, insightful theorizing, let's say. So nihilism, as we've talked about, it consists of the rejection of any notion of objective value. So then we have to ask the question, right? Does Nietzsche believe in the existence of objective values? And most, I, I think many Nietzsche scholars would say that he does not. Uh, and this is largely because he definitely doesn't believe in objective value in the same way that others before him had. Um, not objective moral value, at least not in the not the kind of morality that Western culture is used to. So unlike the utilitarians, he doesn't believe that pleasure and pain uh, or whatever other terms you want to use that the utilitarians might use, like well-being. Uh, he doesn't believe that these things are objectively valuable. Um, unlike the rationalists, he doesn't believe that values can be derived through any kind of chain of logical deductions. He doesn't believe that values are objective because they conform to the standards of a transcendent God, like the Abrahamic religions, right? So he doesn't believe in objective value in those ways. Uh, but in an unpublished note, uh, which was in the Will to Power, uh, but it, you know, the, the Will to Power is not a real book uh, as it was published. It's a collection of, of his unpublished works. And he said this, and I quote, To measure whether existence has value according to the pleasant or unpleasant feelings aroused in this consciousness. Can one think of a matter extravagance of vanity? For it is only a means, and pleasant or unpleasant feelings are also only means. What is the objective measure of value? Solely the quantum of enhanced and organized power. End quote. Okay, so he's making a claim about objective value. What is the measure of objective value or the objective measure of value? It's the quantum of enhanced and organized power. Now, I would suspect that many people are going to be very skeptical of that statement because uh, many people, I think, when we think of power, we think of dominance. We think of political or uh, interpersonal dominance, right? One person dominating another person or one group dominating another group. Um, of course, that's an aspect of power, right? But this is not what Nietzsche means by power at all. For Nietzsche, power is something quite different from that. Uh, although that can be a manifestation of power, uh, power is much more general. It's, mu it's a much more general phenomenon for Nietzsche than just political or interpersonal dominance. Uh, another pas uh, passage from Nietzsche's unpublished notes, I think, may help to overcome some initial misinterpretations of what he means by power. So Nietzsche said in his notes, and I quote, the will to power appears in the first place among the oppressed, among slaves of all kinds, as will to freedom. Merely getting free seems to be the goal. In the second place, among a stronger kind of man, getting ready for power, as will to overpower. If it is at first unsuccessful, then it limits itself to the will to justice, that is, to the same measure of rights as the ruling type possesses. In the third place, among the strongest, richest, most independent, most courageous, as love of mankind, of the people, of the gospel, of truth, God, as sympathy, self-sacrifice, and so on, as instinctive self-involvement with a great quantum of power to which one is able to give direction, the hero, the prophet, the Caesar, the savior, the shepherd, end quote. So the highest manifestation of the will to power does not appear as uh, overpowering other people, right? It appears as instinctive self-involvement with a great quantum of power to which one is able to give direction. That is, to submit yourself to something that is greater than yourself, right? The hero, the prophet, uh, the savior, the shepherd, right? That's the highest manifestation of the will to power, which is very different from interpersonal dominance, let's say. Uh, we shouldn't be too romantic about this. Of course, Nietzsche used Caesar as an example. And for most people in the Western world, I doubt that we would consider Caesar to be uh, a kind of moral exemplar. Uh, 
But I think we'll see in this series of videos uh, that Nietzsche's pronouncement about the highest manifestation of power in the note that we just read is not arbitrary. Uh, it's not his mere opinion. There is a principled reason for why the highest manifestation of power should appear as hero, prophet, self-sacrifice, and so on. We'll get to that in the third video. Uh, similarly, there, there is a principled reason as to why those people whom Nietzsche despises, uh, who he tends to call the good and the just, are the object of his disdain and the object of my disdain too, as you might have picked up on in part 6.2 of this series. Uh, there is a principled reason for why those kinds of people have our disdain, and we'll get to that too. So this is what we're going to talk about in the first video. Uh, this first video is probably going to be the longest of these videos. There's a lot to cover in this. So uh, some of this might be redundant. We might have gone over a little bit of this in part five, but we're going to have to cover cover some of the same ground just to uh, just to make sure that everything is on the table here. So we're going to cover this idea that humans have two main sources of values, right? We have our biologically evolved nature. Uh, humans have a nature, uh, which evolutionary psychology studies, essentially, and our culturally mediated social norms, right? So we can adopt values from our culture and we can pursue those values uh, very meaningfully. Um, there, there can be, of course, conflict between these sources of value, between our evolved nature and our cultural norms. Uh, and this is equivalent to the conflict between reason and instinct, or the conflict between soul and body, uh, and all of the other dichotomies associated with the ascetic ideal. We're going, I'm going to argue that the will to power, now this is going to be a controversial claim, but we'll get there. The will to power manifests in us psychologically as relevance realization, as what John Verveke calls relevance realization. It's a process of complexification. Uh, and that's the same thing, properly understood. It's the same thing as self-actualization. At least self-actualization is what happens when that process goes very well. The will to power. Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to cover in the first video. In the second video, we're going to look at uh, the will to power as being a metaphysical thesis. And it's a metaphysical thesis that posits that there is a universal process of complexification, which Nietzsche calls the will to power. Uh, this provides the basis for making objective value judgments, and we'll see why that's the case in the next video. Um, it provides the basis for a process understanding of morality, and we're going to look at that in, in the third video. Um, and we're going to look at that in the context of a discussion of the overlap between Nietzsche's figure of the overman and Jordan Peterson's figure of the revolutionary hero. And I'm going to make the case that these are basically the same figure. They, they're picking up on the same pattern. Um, yeah. So uh, in this video, we're going to be discussing evolutionary psychology and cultural evolution, uh, the study of cultural evolution as methods for uncovering the origins of our values. Uh, where did our values come from? Why do we have them? Whose interests do they really serve? And all of this is meant to pave the way for what Nietzsche called the revaluation of values, right? Nietzsche's contention and my contention is that it's only by understanding where our values come from, right? We have to have a historical understanding of uh, a genealogy of where our values came from if we're going to judge them properly. We need to understand the evolutionary origins of them and the cultural historical origins of them. And then, of course, we're going to have idiosyncratic values based on our own personal experiences. Uh, Nietzsche, in the Genealogy of Morals, asked the question, under what conditions did man invent for himself those judgments of values, good and evil, and what intrinsic value do they possess in themselves? Have they up to the present hindered or advanced human well-being? He goes on to say, we need a critique of moral values. For once, the value of these values is itself to be put in question. And for this, we need a knowledge of the conditions and, circumst and circumstances out of which they have grown, under which they have developed and shifted. And that is what Nietzsche attempted to do in the genealogy of morals. And I think that Nietzsche made some mistakes in that book, uh, some mistakes that are totally understandable in light of the time he was writing. But despite those mistakes, I think he... Uh, I think he got it pretty well right, uh, pretty close to correct. Uh, we're going to see how closely 
Nietzsche's genealogy is to a modern scientific understanding of where values come from uh, through the fields of evolutionary psychology, evolutionary and developmental psychology, and cultural evolution. So um, we need to reconcile Nietzsche with evolutionary psychology. We've done this a little bit. We've talked about this a little bit, but we're going to go into it in a little bit more detail here. Um, in order to do that, he must be reconciled with Darwinism more generally. This poses a kind of problem because Nietzsche often, he didn't, I wouldn't say often, but Nietzsche did criticize Darwin. And generally speaking, Nietzsche's criticisms of Darwin were pretty off point. Uh, John Richardson says in his book, Nietzsche's New Darwinism, that Nietzsche made a jumble of mistakes about Darwin and mistakes about biology. Uh, Nietzsche attributes views to Darwin that Darwin did not actually hold, uh, such as the idea that fitness is, is related to physical strength. Um, Richardson argues, and I think that Richardson is correct, that these disagreements and mistakes are basically peripheral. Um, and in fact, the, the stuff that Nietzsche was criticizing Darwin for was stuff that Darwin didn't actually believe. But Nietzsche believed correctly in the real evolutionary process. He just he just misunderstood Darwin. Like Darwin got it right, but Nietzsche got it right too. But he misunderstood Darwin and thought that Darwin got it wrong, right? That's basically what happened. Uh, Richardson argues, and I agree, that Nietzsche is deeply Darwinian uh, and that this Darwinism pervades his entire philosophy. And so uh, what we're going to do here is look at Nietzsche's drive psychology, what's what Richardson calls his drive psychology. So Nietzsche believes uh, that the structure of the mind is not unitary at all, that it's made up of many different drives. Well, evolutionary psychologists, as we've talked about, believe that the mind is made up of many different psychological adaptations. Um, so we're going to compare Nietzsche's drive psychology here to the basic structure of the mind, according to evolutionary psychology. So uh, one of the things that's important to understand about evolutionary psychology, uh, something that's often misunderstood, is that evolutionary psychologists do not believe that human beings or any other animal directly pursues fitness or inclusive fitness. Uh, so we discussed and we defined inclusive fitness in part five. I'm not going to go over that here. Uh, again, um, two of the founders of evolutionary psychology, John Tooby and Leda Cosmides, made the important point in their early work uh, that inclusive fitness is the criteria by which adaptations are selected, but it cannot be the actual goal of the adaptations themselves. As Cosmides and Tubi have argued, and correctly in my opinion, it is, it is just impossible to strive for maximizing fitness in a domain general way, right? So organisms cannot explicitly aim at increasing their fitness. That's not how it works. Uh, this would require a, a kind of unbounded rationality. It would require them to be essentially omniscient, right? Well, of course, they're not omniscient. They have a particular uh, perspective and that limits what they can do. You cannot aim at fitness directly. So they do something else, right? They, uh, they execute adaptations. So evolution results in relatively domain-specific psychological ad adaptations that, statistically speaking, increased inclusive fitness relative to the alternatives for our ancestors. Uh, so to drive the point home here, we do not maximize fitness, but rather what we do is execute adaptations. These adaptations, uh, we, we develop these adaptations, we reliably develop them because they increased the, includes, the inclusive fitness of our ancestors. As an example, we have a sex drive, right? That's a psychological adaptation and it clearly promotes reproductive success. Uh, I use this example in, in particular because it, it makes the point most clear, I think. Um, the desire to have sex clearly increases your reproductive success, but it doesn't aim at reproductive success. And we know this because men who have vasectomies still want to have sex, right? And people still want to have sex with condoms and so on. Um, so that's a psychological adaptation that we have because it increased the inclusive fitness of our ancestors, but it doesn't directly aim at fitness, right? It has its own aim. Um, and so, you know, this, this means that, um, we'll cut that out. So the fact that adaptations only work on a probabilistic basis, uh, 
which means that they can misfire in many situations, and that they were built based on past selection pressures, meaning that they can be mismatched to current realities, are important insights of evolutionary psychology. They were also insights that Nietzsche had. Uh, Nietzsche had these same insights uh, that are drives, right? What evolutionary psychologists call psychological adaptations, Nietzsche calls drives. Our drives can misfire. They can misaim at their goal and they can be mismatched. They can be mismatched because they were formed based on the based on what happened in the past. They can be mismatched with the current environment. Um, another important point that has been made by Cosmides and Tubi and others is that psychological adaptations tend to be domain specific. That is, each adaptation deals with a relatively narrow problem that's related to inclusive fitness, right? So uh, we have we have psychological adaptations that aim at status, like social status or affiliation, um, uh, nepotism, right? Taking care of your kids, things like that. Um, purely domain general adaptations would require an unbounded rationality that is computationally intractable due to comb combinatorial explosion, right? There's no such thing as a purely domain general uh, learner. It's, it's impossible. Um, and I think there is overwhelming empirical evidence that the mind contains many domain specific adaptations that correspond to different adaptive problems. And you can look at that in the, uh, the handbook of evolutionary psychology, very expensive, but you can probably find it online for less, uh, for a, cheaper cost. So I do have some disagreements with how mainstream evolutionary psychologists tend to talk about psychological mechanisms. Um, David Buss in his textbook, so David Buss has the most popular evolutionary psychology textbook, and he describes psychological mechanisms in that textbook. And he says that, and I quote, that the input of an evolved psychological mechanism is transformed through decision rules or procedures into output. Uh, and he demonstrates what he means by that with this figure in the middle of the screen here. So you have input, uh, you have some if then decision rules, and then you have the output. Um, that's wrong, right? In, in my humble opinion, this is a very misleading way of talking about how the mind works. Uh, there are no rules in the mind. I mean, uh, there's no, this is not a computer programming language, right? So that's like how a computer programming language works. That is not how the mind works, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, organisms are not input-output machines. Uh, we don't have precise rules, generally speaking. Behavioral outputs are far more complex than that. And psychological adaptations, generally speaking, are not reactive, but proactive. Uh, uh, at least we are fundamentally proactive, and we are not fundamentally reactive, right? So this looks like we're input-output machines, right? We take in some input, and then we're, we react to it. But like, no, 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 we're always proactively uh, seeking to fulfill our biological imperatives. So I think that this figure from Jordan Peterson's biblical series provides a, a better model for the basic structure of the mind. We're always moving towards some valued goal and we react to inputs based on how they, uh, how they affect our aims, right? Are they a tool? Are they going to help us or are they an obstacle or are they irrelevant? And we're not going to go over that into, in too much detail here. Uh, but this is why Nietzsche calls them drives, right? They are not primarily reactive, but rather they drive us forward towards our biologically relevant aims. Uh, Serena Doyle in her 2018 book said this about it, and I quote, that neither the drives nor the effects for Nietzsche are primarily responding to external pre-existing objects, that our evaluative drives are not primarily responses to actually existent objects can be discerned from Nietzsche's claim that such, uh, such objects such objects should be understood as either facilitators or obstacles to the drive's aim to manifest its irreducibly particular quantum of power optimally, end quote. So every drive, uh, you know, we have a drive to eat and we, we, we want food. Okay. That drive aims to manifest its particular quantum of power optimally. The drive to eat can take over somebody's psyche, right? You see that if somebody weighs 500 pounds, like that drive has dominated their psyche. Uh, every drive wants to dominate. Right? This is Nietzsche's insight. Uh, it's also a, a psychoanalytic insight, right? All of these drives, they want to dominate you. And um, 
they want to dominate the psyche, let's say. Uh, and, and that can happen with, with the drive for food, it can happen with the drive for social status, it can happen with the drive for sex, it can happen with the drive for affiliation. Um, these are generally forms of psychopathology. But yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's, uh, so drives respond to the environment in terms of facilitators or obstacles, right? Tools or obstacles. Uh, that's what things manifest themselves to us as. So uh, we've already talked about, talked about Kenrick and colleagues' uh, motivational domains. I'm not going to go over them again here. Um, but these are just some categories that drives can fall under or psychological adaptations can fall under, right? Self-protection, disease avoidance, affiliation, status seeking, mate acquisition, mate retention, caring for family. And of course, they left self-actualization off the list erroneously, but we talked about that in part seven. So uh, John Richardson um, makes the point that drives for Nietzsche, these drives are the way they are because of the selective uh, advantages that they gave the organism's ancestors. Uh, Richardson says about this, and I quote that for Nietzsche, the crucial further point is supplied by Darwin due to natural selection. These dispositions were one and all designed and fixed in the organism's ancestral line due to some ways that they served the, pre the preservation or growth of its kind. A drive is crucially the sign then of the selective advantages it served at the times it was formed and modified, end quote. And evolutionary psychologists have made the same point about psychological adaptations, right? Drives uh, for Nietzsche, the, what Nietzsche called drives are, are, I think, very obviously equivalent to what evolutionary psychologists call psychological adaptations. Uh, they are the way they are because of past selection pressures rather than current, current ones, and that means that there can be mismatches. Um, so I'll tend to use the word drives in this video, uh, but I may use them interchangeably. So Nietzsche had the same insight that the evolutionary psychologists did, which is that drives do not aim at maximizing fitness or anything like fitness, right? They flexibly seek to achieve proximate goals that would have been correlated with fitness in the past. Um, John Richardson says about this, and I quote that a drive is a behavioral disposition that is plastic towards its distinguishing outcome. The drive is sensitive and responsive to conditions insofar as they help or hinder its pursuit of that outcome. By, con by contrast, the drive is not thus responsive to the imposed end of reproductive success. The eat drive, for example, does not adjust its eating in the light of what in particular conditions serves that success. So a drive's ultimate aim is inclusive fitness, which, which is reproductive success, but it achieves that ultimate aim. It cannot achieve that ultimate aim directly. It has to achieve it indirectly through a different but related proximate aim, eating, sex, nepotism, disease avoidance, and so on. Uh, neither the ultimate or the proximate aim needs to be consciously available to the organism. Drives can work even in the absence of consciousness. So apart from these naturally selected drives, Nietzsche recognized that there was a second source of human values in cultural evolution. Uh, Richardson, John Richardson, in, in his 2004 book, calls this social selection, but it's the same thing as cultural evolution. So in the first video of the series, we talked about the cultural ratcheting process and why it is that this cultural ratcheting process gives us some good reasons to incorporate tradition into our practices and into our worldviews. Uh, you may recall from the first video that this cultural ratcheting process involves the human capacity for imitation on the one hand and innovation on the other, right? These are the two aspects of this process. We have to imitate what came before, and occasionally we have to innovate. Uh, I'm going to read something that John Richardson wrote in his 2020 book, Nietzsche's Values, which I think uh, nicely describes this ratcheting process in Nietzsche's writing. So uh, Richardson said, and I quote, that cultural practices are founded on the one hand by humans' powerful ability and will to share, to have the same values others do. That's imitation. But human, humans also have the capacity, in moments of crisis especially, to remake these practices by revising the norms that guide them. So humans' remarkable development depends on a general and usual will to copy but also on members who periodically innovate and change the content copied, end quote. And so he's picking up on, uh, Nietzsche is picking up on this same pattern, right? We have to copy or imitate what came before, but occasionally somebody has to come along and innovate because the world changes around you. 
And so, uh, according to Nietzsche, our cultural norms evolve over time because we imitate them on the one hand, uh, during stable periods, especially we imitate, but we occasionally have to remake them or Im innovate them, especially during times of crisis or preceding a crisis. Uh, so here we're going to focus on another important aspect of cultural evolution, which is our norm psychology. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in part five, but I have to go, uh, go over some things again. So uh, Chudek and Henrik in a 2011 paper defined the norm psychology as, and I quote, a suite of psychological adaptations for inferring, encoding in memory, adhering to, enforcing, and redressing violations of the shared behavioral standards of one's community. And this is our drive for conformity and for enforcing conformity among the people around us. This is necessary to do what we do as humans, right? It's necessary uh, to conform and to enforce conformity for the cultural evolution process to take place. Um, Chudek and Henrik argue that a history of punishment for norm violations led to the evolution of, of norm internalization. We internalize social norms. Uh, and this includes morality. And this, we internalize this essentially as a means of avoiding punishment. Uh, this internalization of group norms and, you know, our internalization of them and our willingness to punish people who deviate from them is the same thing as what Nietzsche calls the herd instinct. Uh, it is what compels us to imitate everything that came before. So Nietzsche describes the herd instinct as such. This is in the gay science. And I quote, he said that, the reproach of conscience is, even in the most conscientious, weak against the feeling that this and that is against the, the good custom of your society. A cold look, a wry mouth on the part of those among whom and for one uh, whom one was raised is still feared by even the strongest. What is really feared here? Isolation as the argument that refutes even the best arguments for a person or cause. So speaks the herd instinct out of us. End quote. The herd instinct is the fear of isolation. Fundamentally, um, it is what causes us to 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 put ourselves into groups and to form values that it, that allow us to adhere together as groups. Um, those who flout social norms have very often been ostracized or otherwise punished throughout human evolutionary history, and social isolation is, of course, a death sentence for the hyper-social creatures that we are. Uh, even if it's not a, an actual death sentence, it's an evolutionary dead end because you're not going to reproduce if you are socially isolated. Uh, so this has instilled within human beings a strong drive towards conformity and towards adopting and internalizing the particular norms of our, uh, of our community. That's the herd instinct. So with, you know, we, so we have this norm psychology in place uh, and now we can ask the question, so over long periods of time, what is going to determine the content of our social norms? And I would suggest that the major contributor here is what is called cultural group selection. Uh, groups that have more functional norms, functional in the sense that they promote the group's ability to outcompete other groups, are going to survive and spread. They're going to attract migrants who will adopt their culture's norms presumably, and their norms will end up being copied by neighboring groups who want to be like the group who is uh, so powerful. And so in that way, functional norms will tend to proliferate over time. Um, what's important to note about this is that the norms that proliferate through cultural group selection are functional for groups, but they are not necessarily functional for the individuals within those groups. Um, and this creates a problem because this means that there can be conflict there can be real serious conflict between the interests of the individuals within groups and the cultural norms that have been selected through cultural group selection processes, which may not be in the best interest of each individual within the group. And so there can be uh, this this can create this internal conflict between our desire to adhere to the norms of our group and our biological drives, which drive us towards achieving our biologically relevant aims. Right. We can have this internal conflict. Um, John Richardson also claims that Nietzsche picked up on this group selection dynamic. Uh, so reading from uh, Richardson's book, Nietzsche's Values, he said, and I quote, that the principal interest that norms have been designed to serve is that of the community as a whole. 
its ability to sustain itself against neighboring societies that threaten or compete with it, its ability to cope with other environmental challenges, and its ability to hold itself together as a functioning unit. This design happens partly by the deliberate choices of groups or leaders, but more largely and anciently by a quasi-Darwinian selection. Communities that survive and grow, preserve and spread the norms and practices that have favored this success. But a society's changing conditions can reduce the fitness of certain norms, which generates pressure for redesign, end quote. So Richardson is, is making two important points there. In the first place, he is talking about cultural group selection. He doesn't call it that, but he says that communities which survive and grow preserve and spread their norms and practices. Well, that's cultural group selection. But he also uh, picks up on this dynamic of evolutionary mismatch. So the fact that a, a norm promoted the success of a group in the past, maybe two or 3,000 years ago, doesn't mean that that norm is still functional today. And that generates pressure for redesign. Uh, as he says, in, in Thus Spake Zarathustra, Nietzsche said that whatever allows a people to rule and conquer and shine to the dread and envy of, the, of its neighbors, that counts for it as the high, the first, the measure, the meaning of all things. And that's fundamentally what, what morality is about, right? Uh, group norms that promote the success of the group, uh, regardless of how they affect the individuals within the group. So Nietzsche recognized that this process, this process by which norms spread through cultural group competition, cultural group uh, selection, would select for cultural norms that primarily benefit the group and not individuals. Um, we can personify the authority of these norms in the form of venerated ancestors. So ancestor worship has been very common throughout human evolution. Uh, more recently, we, in, we uh, personify the authority of these norms through omniscient omnipotent gods, right? The big gods that characterize, uh, that have characterized more recent civilizations. Um, this kind of god for Nietzsche is essentially an imaginary external authority that commands group beneficial social norms on behalf of the herd, right? On behalf of the group. Uh, it's, it's a way for us to, you know, ima we, we imagine, uh, that our, our norms are, ex uh, you know, internal or excuse me, uh, externally imposed on us by a transcendent God. So we have some unanswered questions here, uh, which we're going to talk about in the rest of this video. So we can think of the mind as being made up of a number of psychological adaptations. Nietzsche calls these drives. These drives set up these biologically relevant aims that we have to pursue. Uh, we just essentially we are the pursuit of those aims. And these can be considered to be kind of innate values. Uh, cultural evolution has equipped us, uh, equipped us with a new way of value, valuing. So we have a human specific set of psychological adaptations for cultural learning, including a norm psychology, which allows us to internalize culturally mediated values. And Nietzsche called that norm psychology the herd instinct. So these values can, of course, come into conflict with each other. Um, you know, in a variety of ways. And the question is, how is it that we as individuals determine which values are going to take precedence? Uh, how do we determine the rank order of values, as Nietzsche would put it? And for that, we're going to need to introduce the concept of the will to power, but also precision weighting, which is something from uh, the emerging framework within cognitive science called predictive processing, which I think we may have talked about a little bit in this series, but not much. Um, and so we're going to talk about it now. So John Richardson has conceptualized the will to power as a meta drive. That is the will to power is a drive that is inherent to all of the other particular drives, or one way of thinking about it is that it's an aspect of all of the particular drives, right? So we have what you might call the eat drive. We want to eat, we need food. Um, but we don't just want food, right? We want to you know, there's the old like cliche saying, you know, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, but teach him to fish and feed him for a lifetime, right? We don't just want food. We want to become better at getting food. We want to be able to exert more control over the world so that we're never hungry. And it's something like that. Uh, that's power. It's growth and control is what Richardson ca calls it. And so I'm going to argue here that Nietzsche's insight about this meta drive has been rediscovered essentially in the modern predictive processing literature. Uh, so 
Uh, predictive processing is an emerging framework within cognitive science. Uh, Andy Clark has a, has a nice book about it called Surfing Uncertainty. It depicts brains as, quoting Clark here, as predictive engines constantly trying to guess at the structure and shape of the incoming sensory array. Such brains are incessantly proactive, restlessly seeking to generate the sensory data for themselves using the incoming signal in a surprising inversion of much traditional wisdom, mostly as a means of checking and correcting their best top-down guessing. So uh, I have my differences with some aspects of predictive processing, but I think the general architecture of the mind that they put forward is, is essentially correct. Uh, the hierarchical Bayesian architecture of the mind that is posited by the predictive processing framework provides us, I will su suggest, with some powerful conceptual tools for understanding how the mind works. Uh, in particular, the concept of precision weighting. We're going to unpack what that means here in just a minute. So predictive processing is a version of what's called the Bayesian brain hypothesis. Uh, Bayes rule is we, we don't need to get into the math here. It's not that it's not that important for our purposes. Um, but just, you know, FYI, uh, Bayes rule is just the optimal day, the optimal way to update a hypothesis or a belief in the light of new evidence. Uh, and given that that's the case, it's very likely that the brain is doing something that approximates Bayesian updating. Um, Bayes rule is simply the optimal way of combining prior knowledge, right? So you have prior knowledge about the world, and then you have new evidence that needs to update that prior knowledge. Bayes rule is just the mathematically optimal way of doing that uh, in terms of probability distributions. So uh, predictive processing models implement Bayes rule to account for how the mind works. And uh, Andy Clark says in Surfing Uncertainty, uh, they do so by meeting the incoming, the incoming sensory signal with a set of top-down probabilistic predictions based on what the system knows about the world and what it knows about the context varying reliability of its own sensing and processing. So we have top-down predictions. We're constantly predicting what the world is going to be like. And then we adjust those predictions based on the feedback that we receive from the world. But we also have to predict something else. We have to predict how reliable the input is. We have to predict how accurate our predictions are, how precise our predictions are, but also how accurate or precise or reliable the incoming sensory input is. Uh, we need to know both of those things in order to optimally update our models. Uh, so within predictive processing, there is a hierarchy of predictions. We've already talked about this, although we, I didn't call them predictions, but we talked about how the mind is sort of constructed in a hierarchy of values, beliefs, and goals with worldview questions at the, tarp, at, at the top. Well, these are just adaptive priors. Within the Bayesian language, we would just say that, that all of these are, uh, are priors that we have. So the function of the mind in this view of things is to reduce prediction error at every level of that hierarchy. And there are basically two ways that you can do that. Uh, you can change your predictions. You can only do that to a certain amount, to a certain extent, but you can change your predictions to bring them more into alignment with sensory input. Uh, so this is what's called perception. But the other thing that you can do is you can change the sensory input that you're receiving. So if there's a mismatch between your predictions and the sensory input, you can change the prediction, but you can also change the sensory input by acting in the world. So if you predict, and this is the way that things are talked about within the predictive processing framework. Uh, so let's just say that you have a high precision prediction that you are going to eat in the next hour because you're hungry. Well, and it turns out that no food is just manifesting itself in front of you. Okay, well, one of the things you could try to do is change that prediction, except for uh, that's a very high precision prediction, meaning that it's difficult to change. You cannot just tell yourself, okay, I'm not hungry anymore. Um, so what, what do you have to do? Well, you have to change the sensory input you're receiving. You have to act in the world to bring about that prediction, right? the prediction that you're going to eat. Okay, uh, generally speaking, we would talk about these things in terms of goals and values. Within the predictive processing framework, goals and values are all brought under the umbrella term of prediction. Um, I don't really like that move. I don't think, I think it's a linguistic kind of game, but it doesn't matter for my purposes. Um, 
it's not actually that big of a deal. It sounds like it's probably a big disagreement with predictive processing, but it's actually not. Uh, because I agree with the general hierarchical Bayesian structure of the mind that the predictive processing framework puts, puts forward. I think that provides us with some very useful tools for understanding how the mind works. So uh, we now need to talk about this concept of precision weighting because we're taking in sensory input from the world in order to update our predictions, but not all sensory input is made equal. Uh, some of that input is going to be unreliable or noisy, and some of the input will be totally irrelevant to your aims. Um, now, the fact is that unreliability is just a, a species of irrelevance. It's a particular kind of irrelevance. So really, we can just talk about this purely in terms of relevance. In my opinion, this is the case that I've made before uh, in papers, and then we made this case uh, in a different way in my paper with John Ravakey and Mark Miller recently. But you need you need to be able to change the weight that you're giving to sensory input, right? So, you know, you may think that this input is extremely reliable, like a certain input is extremely reliable, and then you want to give that input a lot of weight. You want to al allow it to affect your predictions quite a bit. But if you think that an input is really unreliable, you want to lower the weight that you give that input, and that way it won't have as much of an effect on your uh, on updating your predictions. Um, so that's basically precision weighting. Um, but because reliability is really a species of relevance, uh, precision weighting is just relevance realization, right? This is what we've argued uh, myself, Mark Miller, John Ravakey. Uh, we recently published a paper where we argue that precision weighting within the predictive processing framework just is relevance realization. And we do this by showing that there are trade-offs that are inherent to precision weighting uh, that are also inherent to relevance realization. I'm not going to go through that argument in detail. Uh, the, the reference for the paper will be in the description if you would like to read that. Um, it's on my research gate. Uh, you can message me on there if you want it. Um, so we're going to come back to this issue of precision weighting soon. Um, but I want to focus here on the overlap between Nietzsche's will to power thesis and predictive processing. So Nietzsche considers the will to power to be a kind of meta drive. It is an aim that is intrinsic to the aim of all of the other particular drives. So what does that mean? That sounds very abstract. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, as we've talked about a little bit, um, it means that a drive doesn't merely seek to attain its particular aim. So we can talk about this, you know, very simply uh, the, what, you know, Richardson calls the eat drive or the sex drive. Uh, they don't just seek, you don't just seek to get food and you don't just seek to have sex, right? You aim to get better at attaining those things and right? it's something like that. Um, you want to increase what Richardson calls your growth and control over the world so that you can become continually better at attaining your biologically relevant aims. So we're not merely driven for food or status or sex, right? We are driven to continually grow in our capacity to attain those things. And that growth and capacity, that growth and control is power. And so inherent to each of those particular aims, right, is not just the drive to achieve that aim. It's the drive to get better at achieving that aim over time, to exert more control over the world so that aim can, can be continually achieved over time. Uh, and that's power. And so the will to power is like the will to grow and your capacity to exert control over the world, uh, to achieve these inherent aims that are that are inherent to the, the drives that are instilled in us through evolution. Now, I think the same insight has occurred within the predictive processing literature. Uh, so I'm going to read something that was written by Kiverstein and colleagues in this 2019, this 2019 paper. They said, and I quote, that each agent's performance in reducing error can be plotted as a slope that depicts the speed at which errors are being accommodated relative to their expectations. The steepness of the slope indicates that error is being reduced over a shorter period of time and so faster than the agent expected. The steeper the slope, the faster the rate of reduction. A gentle slope, by contrast, indicates that error is being reduced at a slower than expected rate. The agent has encountered an error that is proving difficult to deal with. This has the result that they reduce fewer errors over time. So the point here um, is that we are not looking to reduce prediction error per se. 
right? Within the predictive processing framework, we are not trying to reduce prediction error per se. What we are trying to do is to continually increase the rate at which we are reducing prediction error. And that's different, right? That's different. It's not just reducing prediction error. It's continually increasing the rate at which we reduce prediction error, which is an, a continual e increase in our capacity to exert control over the world around us, right? It's something like that. Um, so um, Kiverstein and colleagues in that same paper uh, say, and I quote, how is precision... Uh, You'll have, to, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, I'm stumbling all over my words today, um, and there's not much I can do about that. I'll try to edit it a little bit, but I have to keep going because uh, it's got to be done. But this has just not been a good day for uh, my ability to articulate myself, apparently. So Kiverstein and colleagues say, and I quote, How is precision weighted in active inference? The agent doesn't simply act so as to improve grip. It is a part of their acting skillfully that they can do so with sensitivity to how well or badly they are doing. Agents that make use of feelings that arise from rates of change can continuously do better at improving their grip on what is relevant in the landscape of affordance by exploring and seeking out novelty. They can aim to better engage with error and attune to the unexpected so as to broaden their skills and grip in more and more domains of their ecological niche. That's all very abstract. Uh, the point here is just that we can we can use uh, our affective valence, right? To wh whether things are pleasurable or painful or whatever, uh, to track our power in the world, right? It's something like that. Uh, our our capacity for exerting control over the world to achieve our biologically relevant aims uh, in a way that is continually improving over time. Uh, and in the will to power, in one of his unpublished notes, uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche uh, said that pleasant and unpleasant feelings are only means, right? They're not ends. They are only means. Uh, they are means to track our capacity to exert control over the world, right? Our, our capacity for power. Um, and, it, you know, again, we have to be clear. When I say exert control over the world, I am not talking about dominance, right? You can exert control over the world by persuading people by, and you know, one of the, one of the things that we do as human beings is the discovery and facilitation of non-zero sum games, right? And so that is a way to get the things that you need out of the world while also providing a benefit to other people, um, which is better because then other people won't try to kill you, hopefully. Um, yeah, sometimes they do, but uh, so pleasure and pain are, are guideposts to the end and the end is power, but that power comes about through complexification, as we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, so, so, thus, we aim to increase rates of error reduction. Which, are, which is just power. And we do this through relevance realization, which is a process of complexification. Uh, you can recall that complexity, as it is defined according to integrated information theory, simply is causal power. Right? It, is, it is the cause-effect power of a system. That's what complexity is. Uh, the extent to which the system is both differentiated and integrated is the same as its power. Um, so as we discussed earlier in the series, relevance realization entails a process of complexification. That is, it entails a process of becoming more differentiated and more integrated over time, which means that it is a process of becoming more cognitively powerful over time. Uh, and so we can ask the question then, you know, given that I'm saying that the will to power um, as it manifests in us just is relevant realization, right? That's the claim that I'm making, which is of course ought to be considered a kind of controversial claim, but it's just because the will to power is a process of complexification, uh, by which we, we become able to, to better achieve our biologically relevant aims in an integrated way over time. And I, I would argue that relevance realization is the same thing. But we need to ask the question, then, can we find this process of complexification in Nietzsche's discussions of the will to power? We can in multiple places. I'm only going to talk about one here. Um, I'm going to talk about the dialectic between the master type, the slave type, and the overman. Uh, I'm going to talk about that one 
simply because it's going to be relevant to, to our discussions later on. But Nietzsche has discussions of other dialectics like this in his writing as well. So John Richardson does a really good job, I think, of describing this dialectic in his book, Nietzsche's System. Um, and why my screen is messing up here. So, uh, he, so we're, we're first going to talk about the master type. Um, so basically the, the dialectic between master and slave is a dialectic between order and chaos. The master type is kind of uh, characterized by too much order and the slave type is characterized by too much chaos. We'll look at what Richardson has to say about this. The, so the groups that characterize the master type and the individuals who characterize the, the master type are distinguished by their, uh, the, by their wholeness or their unity, but they are also distinguished by their simplicity. So as Richardson says, they are formed from relatively few drives, but those drives are well synthesized. Uh, they're, they're put together into a functional and coherent whole. Um, so I'm going to read what, what Richardson said about that. And I quote, as simple in structure and as not subjected or tempted by foreign wills, the master judges by a univocal system of values. They express the synthesis of drives and not either isolated internal drives disruptively rising against it or foreign wills dictating to it. Indeed, this wholeness or single-mindedness makes it hard for the master even to understand or empathize with other drives. He can't enter into other perspectives, bearing so little of their drives in himself. He has little sense of others' values as serious alternatives to his own, and is little inclined to take a, to take a relativist distancing from his view." End quote. So, the master type is simple, right? Cognitively simple, but unified into a coherent whole. But they are unempathetic because they are because they are so simple. Let's say uh, they can't take the perspective of other drives, right? They can't take the perspective of people who don't share their values, and so they are they're strong, but they're rigid, right? Um, slave morality comes about through an easing of external pressures on groups, right? That would be Richardson's uh, case here. And so, um, um, or slave, mor slave morality results anyways in, a, in an easing of this pressure. So uh, Richardson says, and I quote, in this ease, society unfolds into a richness of persons and practices aiming in diverse ways, hard to marshal together. And again, this group structure is mirrored in most of its members. Each his is himself more complex. What need what Richardson means by that is not complex in the way that we we mean it. Uh, he means differentiated. Each person is more differentiated and loosely knit. A less formed system of drives. Persons are not born and trained by society for any definite life. Each is instead composed of concerns and practices, haphazardly falling to it from a general pool, hard to bring into stable arrangement, and often not. End quote. Okay, this is the society that we live in right now. This is our society. Uh, we are not trained into a single overarching perspective unless you maybe go to college and then you're indoctrinated into a very stupid ideology half the time. But for the most part, people are not trained into any overarching perspective. Uh, we have a variety of options available to us. And this, is, this makes life very confusing for us in the modern world. Um, because we, you know, if you're born into a Greek polis, for example, as a citizen of a Greek polis, uh, you don't have any options in terms of your cultural values, right? Your cultural values are pretty, pretty well determined for you. But as modern people and in, in modern society, right, we have a lot of options in terms of the values we can take. And this, this makes us more differentiated in some sense, but it also makes us more prone to internal conflict, and conflict between ourselves uh, as a as people, and so the slave type, the person who who is in this this slavish society that doesn't have an overarching hierarchy of values, right? A strong hierarchy of values. Uh, the slave type is more differentiated, but they're less unified. So they're more flexible. They're more empathetic because they're capable of taking the perspective of other viewpoints and drives. But they're also chaotic and more impulsive and more weak willed than the master type. So Richardson says, and I quote, that from what we've seen, master and slave are both incomplete or fragmentary, but in opposite ways. The master bears only a very limited variety of drives within, because these are relatively few as well as alike or compatible. They are more easily joined in an overall personal project, yet this project remains rather simple. Uh, 
The slave has the opposite deficiency. His drives are many and conflicting, but, or therefore, not well synthesized into a cohesive whole. He is thus more differentiated and encompassing than the master, but only as a collection of parts and not as an integrated person. And so we see the same tension that we've seen many times here. Uh, in this series of videos, right? We see this tension in relevance realization. Relevance realization has this tension between integration and differentiation. We also see it in this uh, process, this dialectical process between the master and the slave. The, the master is integrated, but not differentiated. And the slave is differentiated, but it's not integrated. And so these are in tension with each other. They're in an opponent processing relationship. Uh, this is a meme that I made. It's, I don't know, it's not a good meme, but it's a meme. Uh, the master type is the Chad, right? Uh, Chad, uh, simple, but strong-willed, uh, honorable, active, strong and warlike, uh, internally integrated, but with little differentiation, uh, often lacking empathy, but they are mentally stable. Uh, they're active. They're active in the world. And the slave type is the poor little virgin over there. Uh, he is chaos, right? Internal chaos. They're empathetic and compassionate, but they are weak-willed. They're moralistic, right? So for the the master type, right? They're honor. They're honorable, right? So it's good versus bad. It's not good versus evil necessarily, right? That's master morality. Uh, it's honor. Um, the slave slave morality is very different, right? It's good versus evil. It's moralistic. Uh, the slave type is passive. The slave type is characterized by mental instability. Uh, they are weak and peaceful. Um, they they may seem complex in some sense, but they are internally conflicted, right? They are, they are not an integrated unit and that's what makes them weak willed. Uh, and so for Nietzsche, both the slave and the master are incomplete. Right? The overman is their completion. The overman is the man who can synthesize the slave and master type into a higher form of unity. So the rise of slave morality eventually culminates in nihilism, which is uh, a state where no values are imposed, right? Everything is on an equal footing. And this descent into chaos, as we've talked about, is a kind of catastrophe, right? Nihilism is a kind of cat catastrophe, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, Nietzsche believes it's an opportunity for the emergence of the overman. The overman, which is Nietzsche's ideal, uh, which is the highest expression of power, is a synthesis of master and slave. Richardson says, and I quote, that the overman combines the assets of master and slave. He has the latter's richness of drives, but the former's ability to organize them towards an overall active practice. And so this dialectic between master and slave culminates in an increase in complexity, right? It's the dialectic between integration and differentiation, which culminates in complexity, uh, which we've seen multiple times in this series. So Nietzsche compares, famously compares the overman to uh, the Caesar with the soul of Christ, right? The Caesar being the master type and Christ being the slave type. And so the overman is a complex unity. Uh, the overman who is the most powerful human type is also the most complex, right? He is, in, he is differentiated and integrated. Um, power then, the overman being the most powerful type is power is equivalent to complexity. Right, within Nietzsche's scheme, right? It's equivalent to the the unity of differentiation and integration, which is just the definition of complexity that we've been using throughout this series of videos. And so we also see how the process by which the overman emerges is a manifestation of the process by which all complexity emerges, uh, which we talked about in part three. Uh, we see this tension, right? This tension caused by the competing interactions between master morality and slave morality, between the master type and the slave type. And this leads to this descent into chaos, which is nihilism, right? Modern nihilism. Uh, but out of that nihilism, out of the chaos of nihilism, can emerge a higher level of integration, a higher level of complexity, which is the overman. Um, now, of course, as I, as I argued in parts three and four, or relevance realization, which is the process by which consciousness develops and complexifies as a particular manifestation of that process. But we see that, that like this process is the will to power, right? That's what this process is, this dialectic, uh, this dialectic between integration and differentiation. That is the will to power. It's the, it's the process by which power increases over time. So um, bringing this back to precision weighting, right? In the predictive processing literature, it is precision weighting that determines which predictions, uh, aims, values, goals, take precedence. 
Uh, Pizzullo says that preferences that enjoy high precision will ultimately motivate and energize goal-directed behavior. All that means is that, you know, when he's talking about preferences, he's talking about values, right, or goals. Um, those preferences are hierarchically organized because some are going to be sub goals or sub preferences. And, you know, cutting through all of this jargon as much as I can, the point here is just that the process by which we complexify, which is precision weighting, which is relevance realization, uh, is the same as the process that underlies the organization of our values into a coherent and integrated hierarchy. Um, there's no difference between that and cognitive complexification, right? Th those are the same thing. Um, Jordan Peterson recognized the connection between the process characterized by the hero and the organization of uh, one's hierarchy of values and maps of meaning. Uh, Jordan Peterson said that, and I quote, that the hero is the first person to have his internal structure, that is his hierarchy of values and behaviors, reorganized as a consequence of contact with an emergent anomaly. Um, the hero organizes the demands of social being and the responsibilities of his own soul into a coherent, hierarchically arranged unit. Well, that's what we're talking about here, right? So the demands of social being are the norms that are imposed on us by society to some degree, right? These are the culturally evolved norms. But then we have the responsibilities of our own soul, which are our evolved drives and adaptations. These are a part of us. But these are You can't get around them. You can't get out of your biology. Uh, and we have to find a way to to live in such a way that uh, that we can integrate uh, the demands of social being with the responsibilities of our own soul and integrate them into a coherent hierarchy of values. Well, the role, you know, that's the role that precision weighting plays in the predictive processing framework. It's what relevance realization is. It's the will to power. Right? That's that's what the will to power does as well within Nietzsche's scheme. Uh, those are the same things. So. Um, I want to end just by driving the point home here. So we've talked about this, you know, is power dominance and coercion? Uh, Nietzsche sometimes talks about power in those terms because those are obviously manifestations of exerting control over, over the world. Um, but these are not for Nietzsche the most, um, optimal ways of increasing power. Uh, Serena Doyle, in her book, Nietzsche's Metaphysics of the Will to Power, which we'll talk about more in the next video, makes clear I think her analysis is correct that cooperation and mutualism are necessary for the greatest manifestations of power. So I'm going to read some things she said about this, and I quote, The capacity of a drive to overcome internal resistance and dominate the bundle of drives that constitutes the self for Nietzsche acts as a measure of the normativity of a value. However, a self that rules through cooperation, in Nietzsche's view, is more powerful than one that rules through acts of extirpation or destruction, end quote. Okay, so, you know, we have different strategies we can take in trying to organize ourselves into a coherent hierarchy of values, right? So one of the things that you can do is repress. People do this most often with uh, sexuality, right? This is, this is something that happens a lot because that's it's a powerful drive and it causes people all sorts of, all sorts of problems. And so they just cut it off, right? They repress it. Well, that's one thing, that's one strategy that you can take. Um, but this is not going to result in the most powerful person, right? The most powerful, the most powerful person is able to bring all of their drives into the fold, right? Into their, into a coherent hierarchy where all of the drives are having, you know, they're, they're, they're all being, uh, they're, they're getting their way to some degree or another. They're participating in an overall project by which they are benefiting as well. Well, what is that? Well, that, that's a non-zero-sum game, right? Like that's what a non-zero-sum game is. And so we are trying to discover a non-zero-sum game for us to play as an individual that will, that will benefit all of the different drives that constitute us, right? Because we are not a unity, at least, you know, not initially. We, we can become more unified over time, but we are made up of many different parts. And those parts have values in and of themselves, right? They want things. And you have to find a way to live so that those biologically instantiated values are all sort of getting their say in your psyche. And if you don't, uh, if you don't do that, then it, it causes psychological problems, let's say. I mean, one thing you can do is repress, but you know, like this, this will have long-term consequences. Um,
Serena Doyle goes on to say, and I quote that, I take Nietzsche to mean that compliance on the part of an obedient will or disposition does not entail a relinquishing of its intrinsic dispositional nature, but rather a realization of it. It is compliant or obedient then only to the extent that there is a certain mutuality be between the commanding and obedient will. This is what I'm talking about, right? Um, there has to be internal peace. Like you have to make peace with yourself internally, right? This is, you know, incorporating the shadow, all of this stuff, right? It's all about uh, uh, finding a way of being in the world where all of the different parts of you can can get what they need out of life, right? Because, you know, and in, in, in you personify them because that's what they are. They're like little personalities within you. You know, there's that Snickers commercial. You're not you when you're hungry. Well, you're not you when you're hungry. And you're not you when you're a lot of other things too. You know, when when a dr when a certain drive takes over, it's like a little personality that's taking over. Well, those personalities right within you, right, the hunger and, and all of that stuff, uh, they have things that they want. Right? They, that's one way of thinking about it. And you have to find a way of living that gives each of these drives what they want in one way or another. Uh, and if you don't, they'll they'll have a little rebellion within you. Uh, I think that happens all the time. Um, it's why people rebound after going on a diet, right? You know, if you go on a diet and you essentially starve yourself, right? Well, that part of you, that, that eat drive, let's say, uh, it's going to get its revenge in one way or another, right? You want to live in such a way that you're satisfying that drive as well. You can't repress it. Um, yeah, anyways, I think I've made my point here. So um, drives, persons, etc., are hierarchically organized into a command, a command and obey structure. But this is most powerful for Nietzsche when it is a voluntary and mutually beneficial arrangement. Right? That's the point of this. When it's a non-zero-sum game, right? that's where power comes from. It comes from the discovery and facilitation of non-zero-sum games, both internally within yourself, but also, as we've talked about before, externally among other people. Uh, and those are not unrelated to each other. So, the process of complexification that we're talking about here involves an increasing scope of non-zero-sum games, even when it occurs within you, right? Even when you're complexifying, you are also discovering and facilitating a non-zero-sum game within yourself. Um, our own developmental complexification largely consists of discovering and facilitating a, what you might call a game, that will benefit all of the different parts of ourselves, these different drives that we have. Uh, the better we become at this, the more integrated and the more powerful, therefore, we become. And so the will to power, as it manifests in us, is thus a process that involves discovering and facilitating non-zero-sum games, uh, even when it's occurring internally. So to summarize, I realize uh, this was a little bit disorganized. Hopefully it was relatively clear. Um, but this is the best I could do on short notice, given that I haven't written about this stuff yet, uh, but I will be writing about it soon. So, so in this video, we examined some of Nietzsche's claims about the psychology of the will to power in light of modern scientific literatures. Uh, the, this idea that we're made up of a collection of drives. Uh, these drives were instilled in us through natural selection because of past selection pressures. And my claim is that this is, you know, despite some minor differences, this idea is similar or in many ways the same as modern evolutionary psychology's conception of the mind being made up of many psychological adaptations, which evolved because of past selection pressures. In addition to the drives that are instilled by natural selection, we also adhere to social norms and we internalize social norms. Uh, and these social norms evolve through cultural evolutionary processes. Um, this is what Nietzsche calls the herd instinct, our capacity to internalize and enforce social norms, which can include what we call morality. Uh, these are, this is the herd instinct, according to Nietzsche. Uh, will to power, right? The will to power is a meta drive. It's a drive that's inherent to each of the particular drives, which involves each drive's striving for growth and control over its particular domain, right? Whatever that may be. This growth and control necessarily involves a process of complexification that is becoming more powerful through differentiation and integration. So just to be clear about this, I don't think I was clear about it in the video. So each of our drives is a will to power, right? It's a manifestation of the will to power, but we as a whole are also a manifestation of this will to power because we are an integrated whole. 
Um, and so we also are a manifestation of the will to power in this process of complexification. And so um, I showed hopefully how modern cognitive science, uh, including predictive processing and John Ravakey's ideas about relevance realization line up nicely, I think, with Nietzsche's claims about the will to power. And these claims are largely interpreted through John Richardson, uh, the, the Nietzschean scholar John Richardson, who I think has done an amazing job of synthesizing Nietzsche's psychology. Uh, and I think that Nietzsche's psychology lines up very nicely with modern ideas from evolutionary psychology, cultural evolution, predictive processing, relevance realization, and so on. And so I've tried to make that as clear as possible in this video. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but that was it for the first video of part eight. In the second video, we're going to look at the metaphysics of the will to power. So the will to power is not just a psychological thesis or a cognitive scientific thesis, right? It's a, it's a metaphysical thesis. It's a thesis about the nature of reality. Uh, and Nietzsche uses this metaphysical thesis to make value judgments. And so we're going to look at that uh, in the next video and see how that has lined up with other claims that have been made in this series of videos. So I hope to see you there. Thanks for your time and attention. Goodbye.